Well, hello and welcome to our eOrganic webinar. Today we'll be hearing from Dr. Heather Darby, Abba Gupta, and Katie Campbell Nelson, who will be addressing high gluc glucosinolate mustard as an organic migrant in vegetable crops. My name is Deb Haliba, and I work at the University of Vermont Extension as one of eOrganic staff members. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our articles, videos, and webinars at eextension.org slash organic underscore production. If you do plan to share the recording or information presented today with others, we'd greatly appreciate acknowledgement of eOrganic and today's speaker. Before we get started, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping details. Today's session is scheduled to end at quarter past the hour. Uh, presentation will last for about 50 or so minutes. Muted. I'll ask you, our audience, to respond to a couple of quick poll questions and then transition um, to our Q&A session for the remainder of our time together. Okay, we've got three great speakers today and I will introduce them in the order they will present. Dr. Heather Darby is an agronomic and soil specialist at the University of Vermont Extension, where she conducts applied research and extension outreach on a number of topics, including cover crops, soil health and nutrient management, organic livestock forages, as well as hops, hemp, and grain production systems. She also operates a certified organic vegetable farm with her family in Northern Vermont. She is joined by Abba Gupta, Crops and Soils Coordinator at the University of Vermont Extension, who works with Heather to conduct soil health research focused on vegetable production systems. And then we have Katie Campbell Nelson, who is an extension educator at the University of Massachusetts Vegetable Program. Katie has a background in sustainable agriculture and nutrient management. She conducts research and provides educational program Programming for Vegetable Farmers in Massachusetts, and is the editor of Vegetable Notes, a publication that provides practical research-based information for veggie farmers. Welcome all, and I am going to pass the mic right over to Heather. Great, thanks Deb, and welcome everyone to the webinar today. So as um, Deb mentioned, we're gonna be talking about uh, bi-glucosinolate mustards as an organic biofumigant in vegetable crops and the information we'll be talking about today really is focused on curves that we've been conducting or our teams have been conducting in the Northeast, specifically Vermont and Massachusetts. And um, we'll just get started with my first slide. I think everybody knows how important cover crops are to our agricultural systems and certainly cover crops themselves have so many benefits. Um, to our cropping systems. I'm sure everybody on the webinar today knows um, cover crops can prevent erosion, they can help improve soil ag aggregation and drainage, smother weeds, promote um, soil microbial biodiversity, they can scavenge nutrients, they can increase soil organic matter. You know, most importantly for a lot of farmers, this, this generally leads to increased yields. And there's just a lot of excitement in the farming community right now about cover crops in general. And we see the adoption rate of cover crops just soaring in the Northeast. And really what that's done is, you know, it's really um, inspired farmers to focus on how they can really implement cover crops on their farm and gain from the various benefits of different cover crops. So that's what's inspired us um, in the Northeast to really start looking at alternative cover crops. Um, cover crops that have other benefits that we don't always um, associate with cover crops. And so that would be um, using cover crops as a biofumigant or as a way to control diseases and pests um, in the soil for the subsequent crops that we grow. So cover crops that are considered biofumigants really um, are those that can suppress soil pests and diseases uh, resulting from volatile hydrolysis products. Principally, this has been associated um, traditionally with the production of isothiocyanates um, that are produced when the plant is incorporated into the soil. And these uh, products are released in the soil um, and then um, 
oh, sorry, <laughs> released in the soil and then can have adverse effects on soil pests and diseases. Now, this terminology was really coined back in the early, um, uh, early 90s. And then the term, you know, over time, it's just been broadened to go way beyond um, glucosinolate containing plants and has now just broadened into other pest suppression mechanisms by incorporating bioactive plant tissues. So really this is um, an exciting and, and emerging area of research, but this particular webinar will really focus on glucosinolate containing plant tissues or cover crops. All right, so let's just basically, you know, talk about the basic mechanism here uh, so that it'll reduce what we're talking about before Ava and Katie really get into the research. But um, glucosinolate containing plants, generally we're talking about the plant family um, of, of brassicas, and this can include mustards, canola, um, broccoli, so even some vegetables that we have in our, our rotation systems. But some of these brassica plants are actually being bred to contain higher levels of glucosinolates, really for the sole purpose of acting as a biofumigant cover crop. And so we'll mostly be talking today about high, glu glu yeah, high glucosinolate um, mustards that, can, that have been bred to contain higher levels of glucosinolates. Um, and these levels of glucosinolates are really in, um, high throughout the entire plant. Okay, so as well as the glucosinolate in the plants, these same mustards also produce an enzyme um, that's very specific called myrocyanase. And in the plant, when they're growing, this enzyme is completely separated from the glucosinolate. So they're both compounds are in the plant, but they don't in some ways ever interact. Now, when they do interact, and they would interact when you actually break the tissues of the plant. And so, you know, this is often done in production systems when you um, mow the plant down and then till it into the soil. But once you break the tissues, and the glucosinolates and the myrosinase enzyme come in contact with each other, then that's when we see all of the action. That's when the whole biofumigate process really starts to happen. So these enzymes hydrolyze the glucosinolates to form a variety of hydrolysis products, but the one that has been of most interest and kind of will be the topic of today is the production of isothiocyanates. And that's really the biofumigate of interest at least in our research, um, and it's really the, you know, very similar um, to the primary active ingredient in commercial fumigants like Vapim. And the research itself has shown um, that these high glucosinolate mustards have the potential to control a wide variety of arthropod pests, um, diseases, and weeds. So there's been um, a good amount of research already done on this topic, and people continue to look at biofumigant crops in you know various parts of the country, various parts of the world to control um, pests that may be specific to certain crops um, and to certain regions. And really, the goal of our research is to test biofumigants in the Northeast climate. Um, our specific research at the University of Vermont has been looking at the whole plant itself, so growing the high glucosinolate um, as a mustard cover crop, but also looking at the mustard meal as a potential biofumic biofumigant itself. And other research has shown that the meal or the seeds can also um, have high levels of these glucosinolates. Now, of course, our perspective here is that um, a farmer could grow these high glucosinolate mustards. They could harvest the seed as a crop, um, save some for cover crop seed, and then they could also extrude the oil from the mustard seed. Um, and at UVM, we've used this mustard oil to produce biodiesel on our research farm. And then we've used the um, meal that's left after you extrude the oil as a soil amendment. And we've been evaluating this soil amendment to suppress weeds, to suppress diseases, and then also to provide fertility um, to the soil. These mustard 
um, meals contain five to six percent total nitrogen and the um, organic nitrogen that's in these mustard meals actually breaks down uh, quite rapidly, more rapidly than other organic end sources. So we've both been evaluating the whole plant biofumigant mustard as a cover crop and then also looking at the potential for the seed meal um, that would be a byproduct uh, as a potential to control pests and diseases and provide fertility as well. So here's just a slide showing the uh, nutrient content of mustard compared to sunflower um, and canola, other meals that we've been working on at UVM. And you can see that mustard meal has um, a higher percent nitrogen than some of the other meals, which is um, really advantageous, especially from an organic farming perspective. We have done some early research, uh, almost, geez, hard to believe it's almost been 10 years ago now, really looking at these different meals to suppress weeds specifically and to supply fertility. And you can see in this data that we collected in 2008 and 2009 that mustard meals themselves um, were far more, um, far more successful at suppressing weeds than um, just using synthetic nitrogen or even using canola meal or sunflower meal. So based on some of the past work that we had done, we decided to continue to investigate biofumigants um, in the Northeast. And from here, I'm gonna let my colleague Abba Gupta take over the presentation and talk about the mustard research. Hi everyone. Um, so we have been conducting HDM research at two different locations. And at Borderview Research Farm in Alberg, Vermont, we planted four varieties of mustard and those were Caliente 199, Caliente 119, Caliente 61, and Terminator. And that was at three different planning dates, August 17th, the 24th, and the 31st. And then the following year, we planted Yukon Gold potatoes. And then at our second location in Walcott, Vermont, we planted two varieties, Caliente 199 and Terminator. And that was on July 31st and August 17th. And then the following spring, we planted snap beans. We used the varieties Accelerate, which is resistant to root rot, and High Style, which is susceptible. We also included a mustard meal application in the spring as an additional treatment and spread that by hand at a rate of 520 pounds per acre. So the overall goals from this research were to evaluate different varieties of mustard, different planting dates, and then assess how that would affect yield and quality um, levels of disease and weeds within the subsequent vegetable crop. So again, the parameters we studied for this research included mustard yield, mustard nutrients, weed populations, potato and bean yield, Rhizoctonia solani and Streptomyces incidence for the potatoes, and root rot disease on the snap beans. So in these photos here, you can see examples of these diseases on potatoes. We have um, potato scab on the left and Rhizoctonia on the right. And consumers often refuse potatoes with these skin defects and Rhizoctonia, which is a soil fungus, is common in cool, wet regions like the Northeast, which I'm sure a lot of growers around here have seen. In Alberg, the earlier planting dates, not so surprisingly, yielded significantly more biomass across all varieties. And this is just a photo of one of our research plots. And then you can see in this graph that the August 17th and 24th planting dates yielded comparably to each other and performed better than the August planting date. There was a week's difference between the second and third planning date, which translated to a yield difference of about 800 pounds per acre. And just as a heads up, um, in the graphs throughout my presentation, if columns have the same letter above them, then that means that they performed significant or statistically similar to each other. And where the letters are different, that means that they performed statistically different from each other. So when looking at our 
Alberg results by variety, Caliente 61 and Caliente 119 varieties yielded the most mustard and potatoes planted in those plots had lower incidence of potato scab. Caliente 61 also showed lower incidence of rhizoctonia and it's possible that their higher yield may have improved these mustard varieties ability to then suppress disease in the following potato crop. So then as a visual here, you can clearly see how yield shown in the blue bars varied by variety with Caliente 119 and Caliente 61 yielding the most. And then potato yield shown by the blue line was not significantly different between varieties. And that varied with a range of about 9.9 .9 to 10.6 tons to the acre. So again, Caliente 61 showed significantly less rhizoctonia incidence compared to the other varieties. And as background information on how we assessed this disease, the the diseases were rated by doing a visual assessment on a subsample of the potatoes and the one through four scale is ranked so that a one represents zero to one percent of the skin infected, two is one to five, three is five to ten percent, and four is greater than ten percent of all of the potato skin being infected. As mentioned, Caliente 61 and 119 performed the best for, for suppressing potato scab. And what I found was interesting was that Caliente 199 was the third highest yielding mustard variety and it performed similar to Caliente 119. In terms of weed populations, weed coverage, mustard variety did not have a significant impact on the population leaf um, and grass weeds and the percent of ground covered by the weeds but and this was for the following spring but by looking at the results we found that Caliente 199 and Caliente 119 were still two of the better performers um, without the statistical significance but in any case so Caliente 199 had the lowest broadleaf weeds population and that was measured as the number of weeds within a half meter square quadrat and Caliente 119 showed the lowest population of grass weeds. Caliente 119 also had the lowest percentage of ground covered by weeds. For our, our Walcott, Vermont location, when evaluating the effect of planning date, the main results showed that they're provided here. And what they showed overall was that the July 31st planting date mustard yielded significantly more than the August 17th planting date. So that's the lighter blue colored bars. And this difference is about 700 pounds per acre of mustard. The earlier planting date also showed a significantly lower incidence of root rot. So that's the line shown there. And the root rot was rated by doing a placement and giving a score out of a 0 through 10 scale. Bean yields were not significantly different for either bean variety when um, looking at those being in regards to planning date. Then when we took a look at comparing varieties of mustard, the two varieties that we used, Caliente 199 and Terminator, showed no significant mustard yield, weed pressure, or root disease difference, but both mustard varieties yielded significantly more high style beans compared to the control. And that meant the, the actual data had shown that the mustard varieties, those plots showed high style beans yielding an average of around two tons of beans, whereas the control had yielded only about one ton of beans. Our evaluation of mustard meal showed that high style beans amended with the meal showed lower root disease compared to incorporating the whole mustard plant. And that root disease difference in terms of the scale that we used was three versus 5.02 for the meal compared to the 
the whole plant. We also studied HGM a few years back and found that the soil organic matter increased using a Caliente variety compared to the control and to the variety Ida and Pacific Gold. And then, and that's shown by this blue line. And then also from that trial, we saw that rhizoctonia incidence, although it wasn't statist statistically significant, was lower for the mustard plots compared to the control. So the control had a rhizoctonia incidence at around 1.55%, and for Caliente, it was about 0.55%, and then for the Ida and Pacific Gold, it was close to 0.4%. So overall, the takeaway points that we've gotten from this research was that 2015 was pretty dry um, all throughout August through October, and moisture is needed for effective biofumigant release. So this may have affected some of our biofumigant efficacy, and one may want to consider irrigating the mustard after incorporating to help create a seal over the mustard and help with decomposition. And overall, disease incidence was pretty low, which may have been because 2016, when the vegetables were actually grown, was actually um, pretty dry. And for northern New England, in this region, we'd recommend planting the HGM by the third week of August in order to get decent mustard yields. Um, biofumigant efficacy may vary by planting date and variety, which is likely related to mustard yield. HGM cover crops can still provide general cover crop benefits and add organic matter to the soil, so that's a good win. And mustard meal may be more effective than incorporating the whole mustard plant. Um, and mustard meal can just be another option to consider for receiving biofumigant benefits in a system where you can't plant and incorporate the mustard cover crop before the season if the timing doesn't quite work out for you, but you're still looking for some biofumigant benefits. To continue this research for this coming season, um, on October 15th of last year, we planted a mustard variety um, a variety trial of Caliente 199, Caliente 119, Trifecta, White Gold, and Kodiak. And we also planted a seeding rate trial with rates from 5 to 25 per. We planted a planning date trial, which was planted on August 15th, 23rd, and 29th. And then in the spring, we're going to plant Yukon Gold potatoes just into the variety trial. For more resources, including research reports, um, we've got a cover cropping manual, which will be up in the near future, and we've got a couple of YouTube videos. Then you can go and visit the website listed below. And so I'll just breeze over this last slide with, slide with references and then pass the control over to Katie, who will continue on with her presentation. Thank you, Abba. Thanks, Abba. This is Katie Campbell Nelson. And I will be presenting, oh, let's see here, about growing mustard as a biofumigant in Massachusetts. Uh, I've conducted four trials between 2014 and 2016 on Phytophthora capsaicae biofumigation and nematode biofumigation. And you can see the locations of those trials here on the map in Montague, Massachusetts, Taunton, Mass, um, South Deerfield, and Hadley. So we tried growing the mustard in several different soil types and with several different crops to study the effects of the fumigation. I'll end my talk with some precautions about using mustard as a biofumigant, some of the benefits of, of mustard, and lastly, a step-by-step -step how to actually do this if you want to try it out. So this research I was particularly excited to conduct because it was funded by the New England Vegetable and Berry Growers Association, 
as well as USDA NIFA. And uh, whenever growers are supporting research, I'm more interested in conducting it because I know it's directly for their benefit. Um, so Phytophthora capsicae, if you have experienced this pathogen, um, you'll know it's very destructive. Phytophthora means plant destroyer in Greek. And um, the pathogen is an oomycete. It's not a fungus. It can, with, with oospores, can remain in the soil for 10 years or more. So if the sexual form of the disease is there, it can stay in the soil for a long time. It causes crown rot and fruit rot um, among herbits and peppers, mostly. So for our trial, because this disease is so debilitating, we really felt that it would be unfair to inoculate fields with the disease. So we conducted a greenhouse bioassay to study the effects of what happened in the field. So in the field, we grew these plots of oat, mustard, and had bare strips of sterile soil. So we had th three treatments. And immediately, we grew the crop as intended for fumigation. You, you grow it to peak flowering, and then chop it up with a mower, incorporate, seal the soil surface uh, with moisture, as Abba described earlier, so that you get the uh, um, most benefit of the fumigant properties. So immediately after incorporation, we took soil from these different treatments and brought them into a greenhouse and conducted these bioassays by adding the fumigated soil two pots and planting five peppers in, in them. We then inoculated pots with Phytophthora zoospores and rated incidence of the disease over time. So you can see from our 2014 trial that there was no significant differences among our treatments. However, the mustard fumigated soils took longer for incidence to occur. And this may be enough time for a pepper crop to reach maturity, for example, rather than losing them completely. So the axis, axis down here, you can see the days after fumigation. And up here is the incidence of Phytophthora capsicae out of five plants uh, per, pl per pot. In 2015, we did see a significant difference, significant difference between the sterile soil, which reached um, a higher incidence of Phytophthora capsicae after only 13 days, whereas the mustard fumigated plots lasted longer, 24 to 25 days. And if you look at the pictures, I also rated vigor. And here on the right, for each treatment, we have uh, non-inoculated pots in the treated soils. And then on the left side, we have the Phytophthora inoculated pots. So you'll see just from a vigor standpoint that the sterile soil did not do well. The sterile soil was uh, um, treated in a autoclave. The oat fumigated soil, which is non-glucosinolate producing soil, also did not produce as vigorously. And the mustard soil fumigated soil had the highest vigor. So next, uh, in 2015 and 2016, I conducted two trials at Billy McCaffrey's spring, spring Rain Farm in Taunton, Massachusetts, where he grows strawberry. And I'm not going to present those results in this talk because this is about fumigation for vegetable crops. But the other farm I conducted the trial at was Ryan Voiland's far, Red Fire Farm in Montague, Massachusetts, where he grew carrots in a field that had been in potatoes for many years. The photo here was taken by Angie Medeiros, who is our plant pathologist at UMass. So those of you who have not yet experienced root knot nematode, oh, they can be fairly difficult to identify using microscopy. They have this very fine, these, this is called their stylet, which they pierce 
roots with to get inside the root to form galls. Those knots are formed by female. These, this is a female that pierces into a plant, a juvenile. And once it be, gets into the plant, you can see its life stage here. Within eight weeks, the nematode has essentially tricked the plant into sending photosynthates to these galls so that the female can lay eggs and just really just destroy your crop. It's really a nasty thing that they do. And one, they're very difficult to control because nematodes bodies are basically proteins that don't respond to a lot of different nematoc nematocides. And once they're inside the root of a crop, they're essentially, you can't reach them unless you use systemic. So for a lot of organic growers, uh, they're very interested in these alternative methods for uh, controlling nematodes, such as the use of biofumigants. So what I did in this trial was grow the mustard and looked for path, uh, populations of nematode over time before incorporate before planting the mustard during the peak growth of the mustard and after incorporation because I wanted to follow this the population of these nematodes over time and we conducted both a lettuce bioassay and a sugar flotation assay so the sugar flotation assay is where I collected samples from a six inch depth and then using sugar and a centrifuge we separate the nematodes from their from the soil they float they consume sugar and float, and then I can count them under a microscope. This is a very time-consuming method and requires a lot of skill because nematode, the root knot nematode is very similar in appearance. The meloidogyne is very similar in appearance to Tylinkorhynchus, which is a, another ne very fine nematode. And so as a backup assay, I conducted this lettuce bioassay, which was developed by Cornell, and is simple, farmers can conduct this uh, simply by collecting the suspecting soil and growing lettuce in it. So uh, I was happy to have both of these methods for analysis. Uh, oh, oh yeah, just as a, a comment on the methodology, looking for nematodes, we took the sam samples from the top six inches of soil because that is where, mostly where uh, you'll find the higher populations of nematodes because they're attracted to moisture and the rooting zone of your crop. So that that's most frequently where, where you'll find them. So for the sugar flotation assay, we conducted three replicates and analyzed and counted the number of nematodes using microscopy. And we sampled before we planted the mustard in May, during the mustard growth, June and July, and then after, several months after, as a matter of fact, to see if the, the populations of nematodes had bounced back. The let in the lettuce bioassay, we took from the same locations as the sugar flotation assay. Uh, we conducted six replicates because they're much easier to assess. And then we planted two lettuce plants per pot and rated them after four weeks. So if you remember my description of the nematode uh, life cycle, within four days to eight weeks, the juveniles have entered roots and started forming galls. And so what we're essentially doing is counting galls on these lettuce roots. You can just see them. I'm, I've circled them in this example. Um, and you'll see this RGS stands for root gall severity rating. And this particular root had a root gall severity of four. It had 13 to 40 galls per root. From a practical standpoint, it's really nice to know the various thresholds for actual crop production. So carrots are very sensitive to root knot nematode and, and can withstand a root gall severity of two. Onions can stand it up to three and potatoes and beans um, can stand this severity rating of up to four. When counting uh, nematodes using the microscopy sugar flotation method, Carrots have a threshold of 1 to 10 per 100 cubic cc's of soil, and strawberries have a threshold of 100 
nematodes per 100 cubic cc's of soil. Root knot nematode is host in most vegetable crops, and so it's really hard to rotate away from this pest. It only causes economic damage in some. Uh, for example, some pepper and tomato varieties have root stocks that are nematode resistant, but you are still carrying on and carrying over a population of nematodes unless you can rotate with a crop or even try biofumigation. So, uh, for example, sorghum, Sudan grass is another cover crop that is used because the root knot nematode can infest the grass roots, however, cannot reproduce and, and therefore can't build their populations in grasses. So this uh, Montague cover crop trial I conducted at Red Fire Farm after I planted the mustard, he followed with a crop of sorghum Sudan grass to, to really see if we could keep those nematodes from building up. So here are our results using the lettuce bioassay severity rating on this scale. You can see the severity ratings of zero to five. And we looked in three different areas, the way our plots were set up, we had a bare, I wanted to find out if bare fallow, just tilling the soil over and over would have an impact on the root knot nematode populations. Because that, if you starve them out, essentially that's that can be considered a management practice. So we had a bare fallow treatment, a mustard fumigated treatment, and an undisturbed area which when you're conducting a trial on a farm, it's hard to find a, a replica, you know, an area that's useful for a study. Um, the undisturbed area was actually a driveway between plots. And so you can see from our tables that they just had much lower uh, nematode severity. So we analyzed, uh, statistically analyzed the differences here. The, there was a significant difference between the undisturbed area, as I just mentioned, and the bare fallow and mustard areas. And afterwards, the mustard treated area still had significantly more nematodes than either bare fallow or undisturbed. However, if you look over time, the mustard treatment from, the be from its beginning level did significantly reduce the number of uh, nematode in the soil, but so did just bare fallow. However, from here, I thought these lines would be helpful from just a straightforward practical use standpoint, that the mustard treatments and the bare fallow uh, were enough to reduce the populations to grow onions and potatoes, but not to grow carrots. So uh, ideally here this spring, in a few weeks, I'm gonna go back out to the same field and sample again to see if the mustard fumigation had an overwintering effect and I would like to find out if the nematode population has bounced back or not. So a question I often get when I give, when I present these results are, so does this mustard fumigation do anything to my beneficials, to the beneficial populations of, of microbes in the soil. And while I don't have an, another indicator, while I'm spending hours and hours counting nematodes under a microscope, I might as well be counting all the free living nematodes as well. So I, we identify them based on their stylets. And so based, just to familiarize you all with these different species, bacterial feeders have these really cool um, mouth parts at the end that are sort of rotate and those, this, this tip here floats around and sucks bacteria right into their mouth. They're so, those are the coolest to me when I look at them under a microscope. Then you have these fungal feeders that have very narrow stylets so they can pierce hyphae. Predaceous nematodes can shoot, the stylets right out and and pierce their victims and omnivores tend to have a wide openings at the ends of their mouths to accommodate many different um, types of food 
Nematodes are really important in the nitrogen cycle and are used to break down uh, a lot of organic matter before, and then when, a nem when the nematode populations die, their actual bodies decomposing or what release organic nitrogen. And so they're, in fact, I think they're an underestimated, they have a large role in our nitrogen cycling. And so after counting all these other free, by the way, also the free living nemato nematodes move very quickly. So it's very easy to say, oh, well, you're not a plant parasite. Those plant parasitic nematodes, they're lazy. They just stay there next to roots. And once they get into a root, they're fine. The free living ones need to move around a lot. So it's really easy to count them and find them. So if you look at the sugar flotation assay results, there is no significant difference. If anything, time thing to do with their population levels, but the treatments themselves have absolutely nothing to do with the uh, free living nematode population. And I suspect that this is because when you incorporate a whole mustard plant, you're in fact adding organic matter into the soil and therefore attracting a lot of beneficial nematodes to break down that organic matter, which is indicated here in the after category, after the mustard was incorporated. Um, so that summarizes the research results I've conducted over the last, I guess, four years now with growing mustard as a biofumigant. Um, and we grew the Caliente variety because it was Brassica juncia that had been found to have the highest glucosinolate production. But I did want to end with some precautions about using mustard as a fumigant in vegetable crops particularly because they are attractive to the same pests as, as Brassica crops. And these are all pictures I took right from my trials. So you can see an imported cabbage worm moth right there and then lots of holes and there's a a flea beetle right here. In fact, it might make an excellent flea beetle trap crop because it, they are so attractive to flea beetles. And then there's a cabbage root maggot, adult fly. So, so attractive to the same insects as well as susceptible to the same diseases, black rot and alternary leaf spot, just to name a few of the common ones. Club root would be a dangerous one. However, there are plenty of benefits. Uh, other studies, not just ours or not the ones conducted in Vermont, um, have been shown to reduce the weed pressure in fields where mustard fumigation takes place. They have been shown to reduce populations of parasitic nematodes and, phyto and these soil-borne pathogens, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Sclerotinia, Verticillium, and Phytophthora can be an excellent green manure and a wonderful pollinator habitat. I took these pictures at Spring Rain Farm in Taunton, Mass. And when I presented this uh, information before, a beekeeper told me, next time I give this talk, I have to say, an acre of flowering crop is worth $300 of honey. And so it's a really nice way to, if you had honeybees, also to produce a little more income. However, uh, one of the favorite reasons the farmer in at Spring Rain uh, in Taunt, he loved this cover crop because peak bloom, we planted in early spring, the, the mustard needs a soil temperature of 40 degrees. Um, in fact, right now, this gorgeous, beautiful April day, 80 degrees outside in Massachusetts <laughs> would be a wonderful day to plant mustard. Um, and the, the farmer was really happy about this crop because it was blooming at the same time that his strawberry plants and then cranberries were blooming. And so attracting pollinators was a really great benefit of, of the mustard to him. So that concludes sort of the, the research discussion about high glucosinolate mustards. And I'm going into the details of actually how to grow this mustard to maximize its biofumigate properties. So early, right at the beginning of this presentation, Heather talked about how glucosinolates and myrosinase will 
combine when you chop up the plant tissue and that combination of causes isothiocyanates to be produced. Now, when th there's some key factors in the practical standpoint about how we, we actually grow the mustard that need to be considered, which is that the soil pH needs to be between five and seven because if the pH is lower or higher, rather than producing isothiocyanates, the glucosinolates and myrosinase will just break down and produce nitrogen. So you will have grown a wonderful green manure cover crop, but instead of allowing that chemical reaction to occur, you, you won't have been able to create uh, the chemical reaction for isothiocyanates. So step number one, buy the seed. And we recommend the varieties Caliente or Pacific Gold and their sources of where you can buy them. The cost for these treatments are about $5 a pound or $50 an acre. That's something to consider if you're still using soil fumigants. This is actually a very cheap way of fumigating your fields as well as cover cropping and adding organic matter. You then want to select a field where you can actually grow this cover crop. So a field where you can reduce the weed pressure, field where you might have a nematode pot problem or a soil-borne pathogen that you'd like to control, or just a field you want to add organic matter to. Um, definitely look for a field that you don't plan for another brassica rotation. You may consider growing brassicas in the same field at the time, but if you want to rotate away from brassicas, plant it in a field where you have something else planned. It's a great cover crop before pumpkins, for example, because you can incorporate and then plant in early June. You need a 55 to 70 day window to reach the uh, peak bloom, which is the time at which you want to chop and incorporate. So 55 to 70 days is required. And then, uh, oh, a mo sorry, I said earlier, minimum soil temperature of 40 degrees, and it should be 45 degrees. So it does germinate at fairly cool soil temperatures, which is nice. You must prepare and fertilize your field to add 50 to 80 pounds of nitrogen like any other crop you really want to you want to um you know do the, your best cultivation and um fer fertility practices to get this cover crop to grow well 20 to 30 pounds of sulfur if your fields are low in sulfur may be added as uh using gypsum or sulpo mag if you also needed um potassium be because in, added sulfur has been shown to increase the glucosinolate production of these mustard plants. And lastly, I had mentioned already, maintaining a pH in the range of six to seven is really important in order to make sure that the isothionates, isothiocyanates, that's a mouthful, are actually produced. So then seeding the field becomes, I, I experimented with all these different methods because I had the time in the fields and I was doing this trial anyway. Um, and so I tried a no-till grain, grain drill, and this was really the best option. I know a lot of folks don't have this choice for seeding, um, but it is the most economical as well because you only need nine to 12 pounds of seed per acre. We also used a Brilliant Sure Stand, which is a hay seeder. You can see this long box here is where all the seed goes. And there's a dibbler underneath, a fairly heavy dibbler right in the back that pulls along. And you need a slightly higher rate of 12 to 15 pounds per acre. And lastly, we tried broadcasting the seed and then following it with this Perfecta cultivator. We lifted the tines here so that just the cultivator wheels in the back were slightly rolling over the soil. And that was just enough to cover the seed just right. Um, and But that requires the highest rate, seeding rate of 15 to 20 pounds per acre. So this is what your crop should look at the time you incorporate. And this picture was taken by a farmer 
um, in Eastern Mass who picked up this method of, of crop growing. Um, and you can even see the, the bees in this picture. There's one there and there's one there. It's just, just such an amazing pollinator habitat um, and bees and wasps. And then if you want to look at the, the mustard, this is what it should look like where the most of the flowers are open uh, and that's peak blue, but before you're starting to get seed pods so that your your tissue is nice and green. So this might explain some of the reason why Heather found the high nitrogen uh, content of this this seed, of the meal from this crop because the the seed meal being produced is um it will break down more quickly with more of this content. So once you've reached your peak bloom, you are now ready to chop or with a flail or rotary mower. And you wanna really just chop up all the tissue while the mustard's in peak bloom. Then incorporate immediately with a chisel plow, rototiller, or a heavy disc. I found a rototiller to be pretty useful. You can go it down just to the depth you want, about six inches to eight inches. Um, and then last step is to seal the soil surface with a heavy board or a roller. And this is the back of the brilliant cedar, which was perfect. Um, you want to seal it in so that those mustard gases are right there in the uh, soil profile where the pathogens you're trying to control or the pests you're trying to control may be, or the weed seed might be. Um, and of course, this is such a, you can really, if you look into the, all the details to make it perfect, uh, if it's not gonna rain, you might wanna irrigate just so that you can get some moisture in there. It is possible to do this effectively. It just takes a little bit of practice. And I've been very pleased with the results. So you can, end this um, treatment by following with a main season crop such as pumpkins or next following year you can try strawberries um, but of course continue using other management strategies for your field. Great, thank you Katie and Abba and Heather. Um, so we're going to move right over to our Q&A session. Okay, so I'm gonna just jump right in. Um, let's see, can these varieties be planted as spring, summer cover crop spring seeded or do they only germinate perform well as a late summer seeded crop? Do either, do any of you know? This is Katie, and uh, I've grown the mustard at many different times of year. A hard time to get it to germinate, I found, was actually July, mid-season in the summer when the soils were really dry. Um, but it, as long as your soil temps are 45 degrees or more, it will germinate just as well. And as long as you have enough time to, for it to reach peak bloom, which is to say about 70 days before your frost date. So any time during the year you have a window that meets that need, you can plant. Great. Um, this, Katie, this one is for you. At Red Fire Farm, nematode population for the mustard trial so high at the beginning of the trial. Why weren't they all, all three of those, very similar? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so the, the three areas for the trial were um, the undisturbed area was a drive aisle, which did not have, would, which was always a driveway and it had grasses and pasture. So it never had susceptible host in that area. So it had a very low nematode population. And uh, juveniles become active in the spring around late April and May. So those, they, they just over, this is a, another crazy thing about uh, nematodes is they have, their blood is ma basically made up of sugars that allow them to hibernate over the winter and then as the temperature and moisture comes back in the spring they become active so our we had really high populations right at the beginning of the season when they first become active 
so that I, I I think that answers the question. That's interesting. Um, and this one I'm, is also a question for you, Katie. Um, I'm a strawberry grower, curious about using these mustards to drive down harmful soil-borne fungi prior to planting strawberries. Um, you had mentioned that you had some research results um, for the Taunton Mass farm. And where might we be able to find those results? Um, well, I looked at nematodes again lesion and root knot nematode at the strawberry farm and I did not look at the effect of the mustard on verticillium because I don't really have a good way to assess verticill if that's one of the um, diseases found in strawberry production so I this this trial actually wasn't didn't look at the diseases it it just looked at nematodes oh, um, I see I see yeah there was a, um, just, uh, I know that um, here in Vermont, there was a farmer who conducted a, um, a SARE, Northeast SARE farmer grant looking at um, mustard in organic strawberry production. So maybe mm -hmm. it would be helpful. I can, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what he found, but I'm going to just pop in the, um, the chat box here, um, a link to the results so you can take a look. Okay. Um, okay, so for pH, ideal pH, um, you mentioned, um, there was a little confusion, you mentioned 5 to 7 for P ideal pH and then later 6 to 7, so um, right. can you just clarify that? I, I think I, I, yeah, that's a good question too. Um, 6 to 7 is the best pH range for most vegetable crops, uh, although if you're trying to control scab in potato, you might want to keep it around 5, so, but, but, um, I don't have the image isn't in my talk the one that I sent I have a figure from a paper that was published showing that the best range is between five and seven um, so that's so just maintaining your pH between five and seven is is ideal okay great where might I find a list of resistant of resistance of veg crops to root knot nematode where can I buy Mustard meal for field application. I don't. Can you buy um, mustard meal commercially? So for the mustard meal question, um, that is one that came up before. I'd have to go back and look at where that would be sourced from. The way that we had done it on our farm is we're able to press. We have an oil seed press for our oil seed projects as well. Um, so we actually made our own mustard meal. And yeah, I would need to look back. Um, so if there's a way that I could send this answer afterwards, or maybe just during this talk, I can look it up and then um, pass that over to you, Deb, to share. Sure, sure. I'm happy to. And we can follow up with folks afterwards, too. OK, great. Mm -hmm. um, can you make an infusion to spray on the plants? I haven't read about making a mustard infusion specifically as a spray. I don't know if, Katie, you've come across anything like that. I have a feeling that that would not be as effective for the fumigant properties of the mustard because it has to be in a, in a not completely anaerobic environment, but if, if exposed to oxygen, um, you lose the effects of the fumigation. And so having a, a mustard spray material that you spray onto leaves of crops, I just don't think would have the same effects as if you actually incorporate the material into soil and uh, seal it in or cover it. In fact, some growers I worked with were looking at, they grew the mustard, incorporated it, and immediately lay black plastic over it in the fall for next season planting. So this is really a, a methodology that's good for soil borne issues and not really for um, other above ground issues. Great, and then um, just back to the seed, um, mustard seed meal um, question. Um, someone did type in that they do um, sell it commercially on the West Coast, California and Washington. So I'll just pop that in the chat here so you can see that. Of course, there's probably, um, there's one source for you, okay? Great. 
Um, how just long, to add, oh, so, yeah, go oh, sorry, ahead. I'm sorry. Add to that. A, a while ago, I ran into a company called Must Grow. Mm. And I think they're based out of Canada from the canola, but it's canola press, not necessarily um, caliente. They, they may have found a higher glucosinolate material, but yeah. Anyway, the company was called Must Grow. Must Grow. Great. Thank you. And so also how, the... Oh, go ahead. go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, just to follow up. The link that was shown in the chat there is the same source as what I had previously found for mustard meal. Oh, great. Great. Thank you. So how long does the biofumigant properties last in the soil to control diseases? That's a good question. Um, 10 days is the effective period that the biofumigation is actively taking place. For most soil types, it all depends on environment and soil type. Um, but roughly 10 days is the window you would you should avoid going in to plant another crop because the fumigation can can also impact germination. So after that 10 day window, just don't reintroduce your pests, right? That's the, <laughs> um, it's that's easier said than done. But the, the the active period of fumigation it doesn't really last that long. It just is like wipes gives you a clean slate to start with. Okay, great. Um, Katie, you, you, I think you addressed this, but I just wanted to ask it. Um, what effect does the biofumigant have on beneficial soil fungi and bacteria? You kind of talked about the live uh, free living nematodes. Right, so I was using free living nematodes as a proxy to, because the free living nematodes are the ones that feed on fungi and bacteria. So if there were no fungi or bacteria in my soil, the free living nematodes wouldn't be there either. Um, so being able to count them and see that their populations were not affected by fumigation, I felt comfortable that that the fumigation wasn't hurting the rest of my microbial beneficial population. Gotcha, great. We have a couple of high tunnel questions. Um, so the first one is, do you have any input on growing these mustards in a high tunnel prior to summer crops like peppers or um, and or pe uh, tomatoes? I don't have any experience growing them in a tunnel situation, but I don't see why they couldn't be. Yeah, I don't see why they couldn't be either. Um, we haven't done anything in a high tunnel so far. Okay. Um, yeah, and the, and the companion question is, any problems for C using mustards in high tunnels for disease? So not that we know of, right? Mm. No, but you do. You would have to actively irrigate that because even more so than in field production, your your high tunnel is more like a desert. You know, it doesn't get natural rainfall, so definitely irrigate after incorporation. And then the other consideration that I have is in a high tunnel where y you would want to just ensure that you have good air circulation to prevent disease on the mustard crop itself or um, white mold from developing as mm. well. So airflow would be a good thing to consider in your setup as well. Oh yeah, good point. Um, can I, could I seed or transplant cabbage right among mustard or are they mutually exclusive? Um, um, maybe Katie, do you want to take that one? If um, I think you had mentioned possibly planting brassicas within the same field as as the HGM. Yeah, um, mustard grows up to a height of about about waist height, and so I'm not really sure what the question is referring. Like, it would be pretty hard to plant cabbage right into a field of mustard. It, it would they would out, it would outcompete the cabbage. I guess I'm not really sure. Okay, uh, maybe the person who asked that they can type type in to clarify. Um, and until that time, um, do you recommend combining mustard with any other cover crop varieties? 
Yeah, I think, well, depending on what you want to do with it. If the soap, if you really want fumigate, if you really want to use it for fumigation, um, not in my research, and Abba, you, maybe you can speak to this, but I, um, other uh, mustard cover crops have been looked at for their fumigant properties, and um, tillage radish doesn't produce as much. Um, so if you really want the fumigation, just grow the, the caliente, the brassica gentia, high glucosinolate mustard, and only that. But if you want it for the other benefits that it offers, which is um, lots of, it's supple as a green manure, so quick nitrogen release, it could, it has about the same growth length as oats, you know, so you could maybe make some oats or peas, uh, or even maybe mustard and peas instead of oats and peas. I don't know, Abba? Yeah, I agree. Um, if your main goal is for the biofumigant properties, then I think it would probably be best to just stick with the HGM. But um, if you are trying to find additional sources of organic matter, then maybe you'd want to mix in um, some oats or like Katie was suggesting with the peas, then that could be another boost of nitrogen. Um, so yeah, some mixes would be possible. And our team has done a lot of research on cover crop mixes that's on our website too. Um, so far we haven't looked at mixing HGM with anything else, but yeah, I'd agree with what Katie's saying about some mixed potentials. Mm -hmm. And then you had mentioned that, um, didn't you mention Katie that uh, Red Fire Farm did an uh, HGM and then they planted another type of cover crop following that as a succession crop? Correct, they followed the mustard with sorghum Sudan grass, which also is allelopathic and has, it's not the same, it's, they don't produce isothiocyanates, but the um, sorghum has been shown to have um, suppression qualities for nematodes as well. So in rotation after, if you had a whole fallow year, you could do mustard, sorghum mustard, for example. Great. Um, the next question in the queue says, one speaker said there's a possibility of growing mustard in the fall, planting a transplanted crop like strawberries or peppers the next spring. Any concern about biofumigant preventing establishment of the transplants? Uh, right, yeah. So that's why I, I suggest that window of time, 10 days or more, um, so that the fumigation has completely occurred and uh, then you, you, you don't have to worry about your transplants or your seeds germinating. And in that situation, is there any um, concerns about the effectiveness of the disease suppression qualities over time, like, like over the winter? Uh, right. Um, you, well, like I said, you would want to avoid reintroduction of pathogens by bringing in diseased plants, for example. You could repeat, you could do back-to-back -back plantings of this, of the mustard to get the most of your fum out of the fumigant practices. Uh, but yeah, the longer you go, the more likely it is for pathogens to return. Okay, great. Um, I'm just looking through. I'm not seeing any uh, additional questions in the queue, so we'll just give one more uh, couple of seconds here, minutes, to see if anybody has any other questions. Sort of our last call. And I know it, sometimes it takes a little bit to type it in and for it to pop up for me, so I'm just going to Keep looking here. Okay, it doesn't look like any other questions. Talking slowly, just in case. Okay. Any final words of wisdom, Abba, Katie? Well, I guess I'd Have say that um, this has been a really interesting cover crop for 
as to grow. I've definitely learned a lot about it. And um, it's been really neat to see how planning dates and different varieties could have an a, effect on this and to just continue to learn more about the cover crop. And um, I'm just really glad that we got to be part of this webinar Everyone show, for everyone who came and to share what we've learned about the cover crop. And if there are any other questions that come up, then people can feel free to reach out and um, contact me, let me know. Excellent. Okay. I guess I would say the same. Um, have a great growing season. And if you feel like experimenting with this mustard, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks. And uh, yeah, great. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Katie and Heather. Um, and thank you all for all of your great questions. Thanks again for joining us, everyone, and have a good growing season. Take care.